welcome out once again to Cliffdale's Wednesday Night Bible Study. Thank you for being here with us. Let's just take a moment to enter God's presence to invite the Holy Spirit to just come in. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place in the name of Jesus. We say, come in and have your way. Oh God, do what you want to do. Heavenly Father, we just set aside every care, every worry in the name of Jesus. Every concern, every doubt, anything that would try to come in and hinder us learning about you, oh God. We break its power over our life right now in the name of Jesus. And we say, Heavenly Father, just have your way. Have your way. Have your way in this place. Do what you want to do, oh God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. How we love you. How we love you. How we love you. How we love you. How we love you, God. Come on, just right there where you're out. Just begin to set your attention. Put your focus. Put your focus on him. Put your focus on who he is. Put your focus on all that he has done. The blessings that he has poured out into your life. God, cause us to come to a deeper understanding of your goodness. God, we want to know you more tonight. We want to come to know you more. Come to a greater understanding of who you are. Won't you enable us to do that, God? Won't you enable us to come to know you a little bit better? Tonight. Oh, Father, we love you. How we love you. How we love you. How we love you. For you are great and you are greatly to be praised, oh God. There is none who is like unto you, our King of glory. No, 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 not even one who is like unto you. King of kings and Lord of lords, you are our mighty God, our everlasting Father. You are good, you are great, and you are greatly to be praised, O God. Greatly to be praised, you are the Rose of Sharon. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, you are King. You are our peace, you are our safety. You are our security. You are our high tower. You're the one we run to when we are in need, oh God. And you're not just our God, but you are our Father. You are our Abba. You are our Abba, 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 Father. How we love you. How we love you. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Have your way, have your way, have your way. And Father, we don't just pray over ourselves, but God, we say have your way in our homes tonight. Have your way in our spouse. Have your way in our children, God. Do what you want to do, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Do what you want to do. Father, I will only be satisfied if you have your way. If God, I don't demand that you fall in line with me, but God, I will only be satisfied if I force myself, tell myself to fall in with your will, with your plans. Jesus, 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 Jesus. How we love you, how we love you. Jesus, you are great and you are greatly to be praised. Your word, your word. Heavenly Father, I say just come and rest. Come and rest on us. Cause our heart, our soul, our emotions, oh God, cause them Ah, to be like parched earth in need of your goodness, in need of your greatness, God. Father, your word says that if we hunger, that if we thirst after righteousness, that we will be filled. Oh, Father, we desire tonight to be filled with your goodness and filled with your greatness. God, we want to be filled with who you are how you are, what you are, and why you are, God. Oh, that is our one heart's cry. Our one heart's cry, oh God. That you would do what you want to do. Yeah, 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 God. How we love you. Oh, how we love you. Won't you just right there, just begin to declare your love for your heavenly Father. How we love you. How we love you. How we love you. We love you. How we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. Oh, how we love you, we love you. And Father, we just submit ourselves to your will right now in the name of Jesus. 
realizing that we were made to do things your way. So God, teach us to do things your way, to do things how we ought to do them. Show us, God, that your, Jesus, your way is the only way. It's the best way. Your truth is the only truth, and it's the best truth. Your life is the best life, and it's the only life. So let us learn to live a little bit more like you tonight, I pray. Father, we love you now, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, welcome out. Give somebody there in your... Uh, living room, a high five, give him a handshake, tell him it's good to see him at home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome once again out to Cliffdale's Wednesday night Bible studies. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, before we jump into the Word of God, I want to go over just a few announcements. Uh, first off, giving huge props to our outreach team and our food bank team. Um, over the course of this COVID uh, uh, pandemic difficulty hardship, uh, we've given out nearly uh, to 1,000 people in the past three weeks. 17,000 pounds of food was given out last week. Uh, the first week of outreach, we gave out 150 meals. Second week, 250. Last week, we gave out one, 170. And so just a lot of good outreach reaching out to those in our community who are in need. And we're going to continue to do this to the best of our ability for as long as this pandemic lasts. You can know that. Um, if, you are an inter- or if you are interested in getting something from the food bank, they will um, be giving out on Wednesdays between 5 and 6, and then uh, the outreach team gives out on Saturdays between 11 and 1. Uh, both of them would like to use you as volunteers. If you'd like to help volunteer, you can get with Miss Judy for the food bank or Miss Barbara Wilson with the outreach team. <clears throat> so, yeah, just a lot of great stuff. Let's see. Oh, great new thing we just began and are kicking off is our uh, Hope Hotline. Um, if you are an individual who would like prayer, encouragement, um, you know, a scripture, whatever, um, you can call this number. Our altar workers are standing by. If, they're, if they don't pick up, leave a message. They will call you back. But the number for that is 910-273-6372. That's 910-273-6372. Be sure to give them a call. Um, again, and uh, it can be for anything. If you want to receive salvation, um, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, if you want somebody to pray with you about your finances or or for fear. A um, friend of mine from way back, Jay, uh, Jason, uh, called in. He had dropped a... Uh, a car right on his foot um crushed the bones and uh, he called up today just asking for our prayer team to continue to keep him lifted up in prayer also uh, i recommend you try to join me every day for your daily challenge devo and prayer time um, i do it around one two o'clock uh, so if you're able to be there between one one and two come out and join us for that facebook live and if you're not then just come back and catch it later uh, during those times of devotion prayer and challenge um, i'm taking prayer requests and we've got several individuals who um, we will continue to keep lifted up in prayer. Um, And if you're an individual who would like to join us or you have a prayer request, you can add that to the thread below um, that live session. Uh, If you are in Ministry of Helps, we do have a Ministry of Helps Zoom meeting this uh, this Friday at 6 p.m. You should have gotten an invitation to that. Click the invitation. It'll bring you right there. Um, I just want to take some time. I know we cannot meet Virtu- or meet together all in one place, but we can meet virtually. And so I just want to give have a time of impartation, sharing with you some leadership principles during this time of crises that God has kind of uh, just placed upon my heart. Um, and they are principles. I believe that we, there are certain things we can be doing to make this time better than it is. If we're just uh, staying in bed all day and in our pajamas, that might be nice for a rest one day, but at the end of the time, uh, it will not be best for us overall. And so come out and be a part of that Zoom meeting. Uh, as I share those principles um, with you. All right. Um, So I was talking to uh, several of the leadership, and um, because they've got uh, stimulus checks still coming out, things like that, we will be continuing this Wednesday, this Sunday, continuing to receive first fruits. Um, Like I said, we had uh, one family give their entire first fruit check. They just said, Pastor, we, 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 uh, it's nice to have this, but we just want to give the whole thing to to the church. And uh, amen. Okay. Um, Others have asked that we hold off so that once they get their stimulus check, they'll be able to Uh, give a portion of that also. And so um, either way, if you are an individual and want to continue giving your first fruit, you can. On Wednesday nights, we don't do two separate givings. We receive both first fruits and tithes and offerings both at the same time. So if that's you and you're ready to give, just take that gift right there, whether it's your first fruit, your tithe, your offering, just lift it up. 
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for each giver tonight. Father, I pray a special blessing over each individual who is giving, that, Father, um, you would bless them in all things, not just in their finances, God, but they would be blessed with the talent. They'd be uh, blessed with the resources, that, God, they, they would be blessed in their time and blessed in their relationships, oh, God, that each aspect of their uh, 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 lives, God, would be blessed with heavenly, godly, good, wonderful blessing. Father, we thank you that you've given to us, and so now we can give back to you. We ask that you take these gifts, oh God, that you use them for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. <clears throat> All right, everybody, let's go ahead and jump into the Word tonight. Um, turn in your Bibles with me, if you would. I'm just reading over our announcements, making sure I don't have anything else. Yep, I think we're good to go. All right, um, so yeah, let's uh, open our Bibles up to Romans chapter 8. If you have been with us, you know that uh, we, after the Resurrection Sunday, we have been on our pathway to Pentecost. Um, if you are an individual who comes to Cliffdale, you know we kicked off our most recent challenge called Pathway to Pentecost. It will go from um, Resurrection Sunday all the way to Pentecost Sunday. Um, it goes from the point where Jesus rose from the dead to the point when uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the 120 who were in the upper room. Um, and on this pathway to Pentecost, where ow, y'all didn't see that. <laughs> it's okay. So um, on our pathway to Pentecost, right? Uh, we are looking at the meanings of certain words. Um, last week, the week before, we began to discuss words like zoe, words like sozo, sotore, uh, what they mean in the original Greek. Um, understanding that, that, that we may have a kind of a definition, uh, an outlook, a perspective on what life, the word life means, um, but then we look at it in the original Greek and perhaps it is much deeper, which in this case it is. Um, the word sozo or salvation, to be saved, to be preserved. Um, in our English language, it, it, it means um, one thing that, that is kind of relatively shallow, uh, but then when we look at the original word in the original Greek, we say, see that it has much more depth. Let me give you this example, and this is one I gave last week. The word life or zoi, uh, we see it in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There's several words uh, in this portion of scripture. Number one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The word life there is the word zoe, as I previously mentioned. It is the state of one who is possessed with vitality, animated, absolute fullness of life, essential and ethical, which belongs to God, real and genuine life, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed in every portion. Uh, uh, you know, a life that lasts, that is everlasting, a life that lasts forever. That's what that means. Uh, the word everlasting there, right, in John 3, 16, but should not perish, but have everlasting, follow me because this is so good, is the word anios, and it means perpetual life. And this is the good part. Also used in past, present, and future. So to have everlasting life, follow me, in, this, in accordance with this definition, to have everlasting life does not merely mean that I have life from this moment forward. <clears throat> but it means I have past, present, and future life. <clears throat> I've got all three tenses, but that, my friend, is what eternal life is. In the, the construct of God's eternal life, I, I don't know what it will be like when we enter into eternity. But I do know that we are living in a portion of eternity, in a portion of everlasting life, right now. Uh, we are living in the present, but understand in eternity, they are living in past, present, and future, all at once. And I don't fathom that. I don't understand it, the, the full depth of what that means. But I can tell you this, that that is what everlasting means. That is why Jesus came, that we might have that everlasting life, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have that everlasting life, right? And let's look at the word saved there, too, because that's the word sozo. The word saved means to be delivered, to be protected, to heal, to be healed, preserved, saved, to do well, to make whole. This is the same save that we see in Acts 4, 11, and 12. And I'm just giving you a brief thing. We are going to get to Romans, I promise. 
This is the stone which the builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation, follow that sotore, salvation in any other name. For there is no other name in heaven or on the earth given among men which can, or, uh, by which we must be saved. The word sozo, to be saved, to do well, to be healed, protected, preserved. Let's look at the word salvation also because there is, uh, nor is there salvation in any other name. That means that in the name of Jesus, there is this sozo. In the name of Jesus, there is this salvation to be delivered, preserved, safely. Salvation, deliverance from the molestation of your enemies. In an ethical sense, uh, that which is concluded, a soul's safety, salvation, messianic salvation, salvation as the present possession of all true Christians. My friends, we have the ability as those true Christians to truly be saved, preserved, healed, to walk that out in this zoe type life. The reason why we are talking about these things right now is because as we walk this pathway to Pentecost, as we um, consider that 2,000 years ago, Jesus is asking, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. As we consider that 2,000 years ago, Mary was running from the tomb, you know, saying they've taken my Lord away. As we consider 2,000 years ago, Jesus is ascending up into heaven saying, go into all the world. And preach my gospel to every creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That is the point in history which we are currently living. And at, this, at that point in history, these words become so vital because understand that these are the promises that God has given us by giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We talked in weeks past how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are all equal in power, authority, responsibility, importance, um, oftentimes we consider God the Father to be more important than God the Son or uh, God the Son to be more important than God the Holy Spirit, but just get rid of that carnal, secular thinking. Know that the three are one, and they are one, and they are the same, yet they are three. God the Father fulfills His purpose. God the Son fulfills His purpose, and God the Spirit fulfills His purpose. And the cool part about God the Spirit is that He is the one that we partner with to fulfill our purpose. Absent God the Spirit, we cannot truly fulfill the purpose that God has for our life. Absent God the Spirit, we can never truly know what it is to prosper or to even really be happy, uh, to, to, to find strength and courage. The Holy Spirit enables us. Listen, we have a portion of those things, but the Holy Spirit allows us to experience the fullness of those things. Let's continue on. So we look at uh, Romans chapter 1, which again, this was last week, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God, that is the dunamis power of God, that, that, that authority, that strength, that strength of armies. We looked at the word last week. If you um, have not watched that, go back and watch it again. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, for it is the power of God, the dunamis power of God, unto salvation, satore, which is that deliverance and preservation. For everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again, why do I bring this up? Because this point in history, 2,000 years ago, Jesus had set the disciples on a pathway to Pentecost, on a pathway to the promise. What I'm doing over the course of this 50 days is I want you to know what those promises are. Not just so that you can have a knowledge of them, but I desire for you to have a knowledge of those promises for what purpose? Why? The reason why I desire for you to have a knowledge of those promises is so that you can begin to take hold of them. So that you can begin to say, hey, you know what? I realize what it is to be saved, and that is what I'm going to be delivered, to be preserved, to be healed. Yes, those are the promises that God has for me. God does not desire that I stay sick. He does not desire that I stay in a place of pain and anguish and, uh, uh, and just destitute and abandoned and abused. That is not what God desires for me. God desires that I live and that I thrive and that I be satisfied in, in that Jesus did not die on Calvary's cross for us to remain in a place of sickness and disease, hurt and pain. He died so that we might live, truly, truly live. As a matter of fact, you heard me say last week that if we are not a people 
who are reaching forward for those promises, taking hold of those promises that God has for us, I believe we're doing a severe disservice to the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I even said last week, trampling on the blood, because what Jesus purchased for us, what he paid was so precious, and what he bought is also precious. I hope I gave you enough time to get to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and there's a whole lot of stuff here. Just so you know, we'll be resting at Romans 8 probably um, for the duration, the rest of the time of the pathway to Pentecost. Beginning in verse 1, it says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I want you to pay attention as we walk through this portion of Scripture, because there's a lot of talk of the flesh and a lot of talk of the Spirit. And we're going to kind of uh, unpack that, slice it, dice it, get real deep into there, because there's promises that are hidden in there, um, promises that we obtain, and we obtain those promises of the Spirit by faith. And so it's imperative that you know that. Okay. Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in life, in Christ Jesus, has made you free from the law of sin and death. For what law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son. In the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk in accordance with the flesh, but in accordance with the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, right, is death. Life. Follow that, friends. We've talked about it several times over the past few weeks, and we'll jump back into this portion of Scripture in a second. We're going to talk about it in a few few moments also where Galatians says, if you uh, live in accordance with the flesh, carnality, being secular, then from that flesh, from that secular sin, you're going to reap death. But if you sow to the Spirit, then from the Spirit you will reap life. Again, the word life there is the word zoe, to walk in God's quality of life. That is what Jesus purchased at Calvary's cross. There are individuals who may preach that we will never experience that quality of life this side of eternity. But I'll tell you this, my friends, I will ever press, ever push, ever fight, ever go in order to receive that God quality of life. Listen, from now into eternity. I will continue to take hold of that for which, as Paul says, he has taken hold of me. So I realize that if I live in accordance from the, with the flesh, then from that flesh I'm going to reap destruction. But if I live in accordance with the Spirit, from that Spirit I will reap that life. As you've heard me share the past several weeks, to reap that life, right? To, 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 to experience that quality of life, it is what you were made for. It's what I was made for. I was made to experience that level, that quality, that goodness of life. And when I receive it, listen, I am satisfied. I am at peace. Goodness, strength, doing, living, that quality of life is what I was made for. It is what makes me happy. And did God do all of that stuff to simply make me happy? Well, you know what? Yes, he kind of did. What do I mean by that? He did it because he's happy. He doesn't desire that I be unhappy. He realizes that if I'm in sin, I'm unhappy. But if I'm in grace, then I'm happy. He prefers that I be in grace. So he prefers that I be happy. It's what Jesus died for. Let's jump back in. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. That means it's the enemy of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Remember what we said about sin, right? But understand, if you are a God pleaser, automatically, because you are a God pleaser, you will also be pleasing yourself. Not your fleshly, sinful, secular self. No, your godly self. Verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. That his being a capital H, so his being Christ, okay? 
And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is made alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, do not be debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For, you, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the spirit, right, and put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I'm concluding this with this, right? Verse 15. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again in fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with God. Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Heavenly Father, God, as we open our hearts to receive from your word, God, as we kind of just jump in and begin to kind of unpack Romans chapter 8, its meaning, what it means to live in the flesh versus live in the spirit, the promises that we can obtain uh, in the spirit, by the spirit, through the spirit, the promises we obtain. If we live in the flesh and sin, fear and death, they're both promises, God. The question is, which one will we sow into? Which one will we invest into? God, allow us to open our eyes uh, to see that uh, as we live in accordance with the Spirit, from that Spirit we receive uh, eternal life, the good richness of God's blessing in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we have to understand that in talking about uh, the Holy Spirit, in talking about the Spirit of God, he is both a gift giver and a fruit bearer. What is the difference between a gift giver and a fruit bearer? Well, a fruit is like what a tree grows, right? Fruit happens absolutely naturally. If you, uh, Jesus even said, if you're a good tree, you're going to bear good fruit. It's going to happen naturally. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort for a tree to simply do what comes naturally. It's like a mother's love. A mother naturally nurtures and naturally loves their child. Uh, now, a gift giver, though, gifts are different than fruits because fruit, that happens naturally. It grows automatic. But to receive a gift, because the Holy Spirit is that gift giver, certain gifts are given to certain people in accordance with their divine destiny, in accordance with the way our Heavenly Father has made them. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. And we uh, opened this up just a little bit, chapter 12, last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're gonna, this is where we're going to go a little bit deeper. Oh. Beginning in verse 4, it says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit of the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit to another faith, is by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing, by the same Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, and to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes, the Spirit distributes to each one just as he has determined. Now, if you don't have a pad and paper out, go ahead and get it out because we're going to kind of uh, look in these. We're going to uh, pull out the microscope and begin to really uh, inspect, dissect, and look at these, pow these, these giftings, what they are, how they work, kind of what they do. These are called the manifestational gifts of the Holy Spirit. Again, the reason why we're examining these things, we're taking a good look, is because we realize God wants us to walk in the Zoe life. He wants us to have that sozo, that healing, preservation, right? He wants us to have all of those things. These are promises that are promised to us in giving us the Holy Spirit, okay? And so in order to get those, let's, let's begin to look at what they, uh, the nitty-gritty, right, of what they really are. So there's three main groups, and if you're taking notes, jot these down. There's three main groups, and these three main groups will have subgroups, and those subgroups will have more subgroups. That's why it's important that you write it down. 
So the three main groups are revelation, vocal, and power. The revelatory gifts, right, those things that are revealed, the vocal gifts, the gifts that are spoken, and the power gifts, the gifts that are performed, okay? So the revelatory gifts, the revelation gifts are word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. That's word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Your vocal gifts are tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. That's tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. You say, Pastor, what are these? I'm going to go over that in just a minute. Right now, I'm just kind of giving you the rough outline. The power gifts are faith, healing, and workings of miracles. That's faith, healing, and working of miracles. Okay, so on your notes now, the next note is the revelation gifts. What are these? Let's, let's take a deeper look at, at what word of wisdom, word of knowledge, um, at what these things are. So you have the revelation gifts, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. What a word of wisdom is, it is the application of knowledge. Okay, what does that mean? The best example I can really think of, the application of knowledge. So I have learned something in the past, and I need to know when in the future or in the present I can apply it. We see this in the case of Jesus when he is uh, in the wilderness for 40 days. Satan comes to him and begins to tempt him. Now, he had these words of no- our wisdom that came to him. Uh, the, the, the serpent said, Satan said, look, uh, turn this stone into bread. And Jesus says he, he took a word of wisdom, right, something he had learned in the past, came to him now, no, the law or the word of God says man shall not live by bread alone. Again, he takes him up to a high tower and says to him, jump off for the word of God says that he will not allow his angels to allow your, your feet to hit the stones. And Jesus, again, once again, having a word of wisdom, right, something he had learned in the past, but very present in this moment, no, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then finally, the enemy takes him up to a high place, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, these will all be yours. If you would, but will but bow your knee. Again, Jesus has the word of wisdom, remembering, you know, things in, from the past, and declares, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. Will you serve? And instantaneously, what's, the, what's the, really the moral and the power point of this? Is that instantaneously after this third time, the devil fled, had to go away. Jesus resisted the devil through these words of wisdom, and the devil had to flee. Uh, let's talk about word of knowledge. Uh, the word of knowledge is, and I want to just uh, be able to, to tell you exactly, that it's re- receiving facts supernaturally by the Spirit. A great example of a word of knowledge is the case of Ananias and Sapphira. We know that they had sold a portion of land, and they came to the disciples, came to the apostles, and laid the proceeds at their feet. Peter asks, is this the complete proceeds from the sale of the land? And she, at first, Sapphira, said, it is. Peter has a word of knowledge. He realizes through the Holy Spirit, right, that this is an incorrect thing, and he confronts her on it. He told her, listen, when the land was yours, it was yours, and you could have done whatever you want. When you sold the land and you had the money, it was yours, and you could have done whatever you want, but you have now lied to the Holy Spirit. And because of this, the men who are standing at the back of the room are going to drag you away as soon as you die. Boom! Falls dead. Same thing happens to her husband. That is examples of a word of knowledge, knowing something supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. Discerning of spirits. This is perceiving the source of a spiritual manifestation. Now, I realize oftentimes here in the United States, we kind of look at some of these um, with a looking for a demon around every tree sort of thing, right? In my experience, traveling through the world, third world countries, um, the spirit realm is very real. Uh, we are very far away from it uh, in our American mentality. But oftentimes, other individuals in other parts of the world, they take the spirit realm much more seriously, and it's much more important, whether for good or for evil. Um, I, you know, I was raised with my dad confronting voodoo, uh, witch doctors, Uga and mambos, um, confronting them during voodoo ceremonies and just, you know, things, stuff, tearing down shrines and um, all of that. So needless to say, I've had my fair um, 
amount of, you know, rebuking demons, commanding them to flee. I've confronted witch doctors and, and seen demonic oppression just lift off of them to where they're literally tearing the, uh, the, 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 the things, the jewels and the, the mystic art garbage, and they're just, you know, their bags of magic and stuff, just ripping it off of themselves, um, saying, Jesus is my king, Jesus is my king. Um, but there was a time uh, when I was uh, away and I was at this conference, and this individual began just manifesting and manifesting and manifesting. And so I walked up, you know, um, but I realized instantaneously through the discernment of the spirit, this was not a demonic activity. This was this girl acting out. I I, I understood and I could see that uh, this was not something that was a spiritual thing, but this was a thing of the soul. And so I looked at her and I said, young lady, you knock it off right now. And she just just like that, just like that. See, that is what it is to be able to discern the spirit, to realize whether this thing is good or evil, whether it's um, of the demonic or if it's a a soul thing, what it is. All right, moving on. The next um, bracket, that's the revelatory gifts. Now we're going to talk about the vocal gifts. These are tongues, prophetic tongues, and other languages. Or, excuse me, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. So let's talk about tongues for just a moment. When it comes to the gift of tongues, this is through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And throughout uh, Scripture, New Testament Scripture, we really see three types of tongues that are mentioned. Um, We see our prayer language, what is called our heavenly language. And this prayer language, this heavenly language, is something that our spirit speaks to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jude one twenty says that that it through this heavenly language, right through praying in the Holy Spirit, we build up our most holy faith. Paul gives really clear definition of this in First Corinthians chapter twelve and chapter fourteen, talking about the the the, the prayer language of it. But then there's not just the prayer language aspect that we build up our most holy faith on. But then there's also the prophetic tongues, and this is where a word goes forth in tongues and he talks about in chapter 14, there must be an interpreter present in order to interpret those tongues. There must be an individual who can interpret what the Spirit of God is saying through that prophetic word in tongues. And then finally, the third type is um, literally an individual who uh, speaks in a new and unknown language. I knew a girl in Haiti that prayed that the Father would give her the Creole language. The next day she, could sp- she woke up and could speak fluently, um, just like that. And that's examples of what we see um, the gift of, being the gift of tongues. Uh, that's not the only vocal gift, though, because we have tongues, and then we have the interpretation of tongues. So if you have an individual who is giving a prophetic word in tongues, then what you have in you need is an individual who can be there, who can give the interpretation for those tongues. So this individual, they give forth a word in tongues, okay? And then this individual begins to give forth the word in the language of everybody around. It doesn't matter what that language is. It could be Spanish. It can be English. It can be French. Um, but whatever the common tongue of the room, the congregation is, they begin to interpret that heavenly language into what the common tongue in the room is. And then finally, the last one of these. Uh, so we have the tongues. We have interpretation of tongues. And then prophecy. Um, now, a prophetic word and prophecy can come out in different ways. It, it can be a declaration into the spirit realm. Um, it can be a thus saith the Lord our God. And I mean, in that case, it, 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 you know, um, if I'm going to say thus say the Lord, oftentimes I will not use my own words, but what I'll use is words from the Holy Scripture. Um, only because when I say thus saith the Lord, I, that's something I take very, 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 very intensely seriously. But some guidelines when it comes to walking in the gift of prophecy. Number one, it's for revelation and for edification. Number two, the gift of prophecy always encourages, it always builds up, it always comforts, it always exhorts. It never contradicts Scripture. It never undermines spiritual authority. It never condemns. Listen, if we feel like we've got a prophetic word that is a condemning, hard-hitting, confronting word, you better be real careful. The first thing you better do is go to your prayer closet and make sure your own heart is clean and cleans, are clean and cleansed, and you are ready to stand at that point. And there's very few times in my life when I've been ready to stand at that point, realizing right that I never want to be the individual who's pulling the splinter out of somebody else's eye when I got that big old hunk of wood coming out of my eye. So be very, very careful with that. The last one, third and finally, when it comes to the major group giftings, is the power gifts. 
we see faith healing and the working of miracles. Let's talk about faith first. So faith is the God-given ability to believe and act on the impossible. And understand that faith is so imperative and it's so important. Because without faith, none of these are even possible. It, it requires the gift of faith for any of these to go from the point of being potential energy to the point of being kinetic energy. If we do not have faith, all we have is a whole lot of potential. And really, the, the way I view it is this, is that individuals who have received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they are Christians, yes, right? But they have not received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. These individuals have that potential, right? They have the potential to walk in it, but they are not living it out. They're not living the kinetic. They're not walking it out daily. And oftentimes I've, my heart goes out because I'll see individuals who are like this and I'll be like, look, you got to know it's so much better on this side of kinetic. It's so much better to not just simply be a hearer of the word, but to be a doer of the word, to be walking this thing out on a daily, daily, daily basis. Friend, listen, I know I don't want to just simply have potential. We all have potential, but I want to be living that potential out. I don't want to simply be saved, but I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the evidence. I want to have each and I, everything that was purchased for me at Calvary's cross is what I desire to walk in on a daily basis. And I realize that faith is the key to that happening. Jesus already paid the price. The promise has already been given. But I get nothing without the gift of faith. So, power gifts, the gift of faith. God-given ability to believe in and act on the impossible. Faith is the greatest of the giftings, as without it, it is, it is impossible to please God. And without the gift... All of these gifts remain in a potential state instead of a kinetic state. Next one is healings. And when we begin to talk about healings, um, again, it's very important that we, uh, oftentimes when we, as Christians, consider healings, we consider it being healed from a heart attack or being healed from cancer or being healed from back pain or being healed from a headache. It does mean that. But that is a limited perspective. That is a very small perspective because understand that man is a triune being. He is body, soul, and spirit. And so to consider healing and only consider healing of the body, we leave out the soul and the spirit. Understand that healing also pertains to our emotional state. It pertains to if we're suffering from things like depression or repression or anger issues or being bitter. It covers all of these things. So body, soul, and spirit, we have the ability to be healed. And not just us be healed, but if we have the giftings of healings, we have the ability to bring that healing to other individuals. And again, finally, last but not least, the working of miracles. And this is the fun one, guys. Because working of miracles, Jesus says you're going to do signs and wonders, right? And, and, and you got to wonder, what's going to make me wonder? What's going to kind of awe-inspire me? I'll give, give you some scriptural um, uh, you know, background to it. Uh, an awe-inspiring kind of gift. When Jesus turned water into wine, when he calmed the storm. Uh, these are miraculous things. Um, when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and literally fell flat so that the Israelites could go into the city. Huh. Elijah calling down fire from heaven. Whew, powerful stuff, right? Good stuff. That is the workings of miracles. I've seen some, some very similar things. I'll give you a quick story. And I know I'm going long, but it's okay because you're watching me virtually. If you've got to pause and come back later, you can. Me and my wife, years ago, we were down in Haiti. And um, we were driving back to Port-au-Prince from this mountain village. Um, and we had driven to Port-au-Prince, picked up some supplies. And we were on our way back through the mountains. And I realized as we were just getting out of the city, had hit a lot of traffic, that we would not arrive back to the village until after dark. <clears throat> and during this time, uh, these mountain roads in Haiti, and still today, are very dangerous. Um, and I thought to myself, oh, gee, this is not good, because if I break down, something happens, and literally in my mind, I'm thinking, allowing fear to get a grip on me, I say, uh, they're going to kill me, they're going to rape my wife, they're going to steal my truck, in that exact order. So we're driving, 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 and um, we have a suddenly moment. And the suddenly moment, the <laughs> 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 The car starts to sputter, starts to die. Oh, no. Again, thinking to myself, right? Crud. It's now after dark. 10, 11 o'clock. It's late. 
this is bad. If we get caught up in these mountains, there's bandits in these mountains. They're going to kill me. They're going to rape my wife. They're going to steal the truck. (laughs) A guy comes by, knocks on the window of the truck, and says, you can't stay here. These hills have bandits in them. (laughs) Exact words, and I'm not joking at all. These hills have bandits in them. They will kill you, rape your wife, and steal your truck. Come and stay at my house. Oh, boy. My wife looks at me, and she says, baby, you need to pray. Okay, let's pray. So I begin to pray, and I'm giving God all kinds of open ground, right? I'm saying, uh, Father, and literally, it's Heavenly Father, do something. Mighty man of faith. I want to give God a lot of room to work. Heavenly Father, please just do something. I continue to pray. Heavenly Father, you know, faith beginning to build. Heavenly Father, don't just do something, but send a car our way to take us to where we need to go. I don't care about the truck. We can deal with that tomorrow, but send a car our way to take us to the place that we need to go. And again, we're continuing to pray, and I'm feeling the fear begin to die, and I'm feeling the faith begin to rise. Heavenly Father, don't just do something. Don't just send a car our way, but heal our car. Do something, Heavenly Father, and and fix it. Suddenly, in Jesus' name, amen. As soon as I say amen, and I mean, this story, y'all, is not exaggerated. This is as accurate, as accurate, and as honest as can be. I look in the rearview mirror, and in the rearview mirror, I see a pair of headlights driving up the road. I'm like, yes, God did something. He sent a truck to help us. The truck pulls up alongside us. Very first thing, they roll down the window. They say to us, "Um, can we give you, you're broke down, can we give you a ride? Miracle number one, right? What was the thing I prayed for? God, do something. He sent a truck. God, don't just do something, but send a truck. He sends the truck. How much will I have to pay you? It will be absolutely free. And if you know in Haiti, me, I'm just saying, that just doesn't happen. A guy hops out of the back of the truck, and he says to me, before you hop in, pop the hood. Literally, literally, I pop the hood. I see his hand go into the engine, touch the engine, and he says to me, now start the vehicle. Starts right up just like that. Me and my wife continue on our way. I tell the, 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 uh, the, the tap tap behind me, I'm like, hey, you guys drive behind me into the next city just because um, I don't want this thing to break down again, right? Again, I'm just being truthful. I was, I was still a little worried. We begin to drive, and not five minutes later, the lights just vanish. We stop. We wait. Never saw them again. My friends, I believe that me and my wife on that mountain road in Haiti, we had an angelic visitation, that we saw the hand of God move on our behalf. I don't know. I know a little bit about motors and about engines, and those who are uh, speculative out there, you're going to be like, oh, that was just whatever, whatever. Listen, you weren't there, and I'm telling you what I saw and what I believe. So that is the, the, the type of workings of miracles. But understand that the Holy Spirit is not just... Um, that 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 giver of the gifts but he's also the bearer of the fruit he it is through him it is in him that we are capable that we are able to bear fruit galatians 5 19 through 23 says this it says the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality and purity debauchery idolatry witchcraft hatred discord Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Friends, that is what it is to live by, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Looking back at the scripture in Romans, countless times in chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, right? Who walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Jumping down to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit will set their mind on the things of the Spirit. Again, and I'm just going to run through this because this is just kind of the opening where we're going to sit for the next several weeks. Understand the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. Really, we can tell if we have the Spirit by if we're bearing Spirit fruit. If we suffer with bitterness, anger, jealousy, all of those things, then you know what? Really, that's the fruit of our flesh, and we need to just let that joker die and take hold of those fruits of the Spirit. Because if we truly have the Spirit, then growing the fruit of the Spirit will be what comes naturally. 
Now, why do I bring this to point? Why do I bring this to bear? Because there are many in the body of Christ who have hatred and discord and bitterness and just ugliness on the inside of them, right? And oftentimes they're the last one to see it. But I desire for us to be able to identify it. And listen, it's one or the other. Either we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of the flesh. So automatically we can say, if I'm not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, then even if I don't like to admit it, I must be bearing the fruit of the flesh because that's just reality. This is not, you know, a middle road that we can have, you know, part of each. We, we can't be, as Jesus says, uh, that thorn bushes that's bringing forth figs. It just doesn't happen. So either we're going to bear the fruit of the flesh or we're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And if we're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, then automatically we can know that we are bearing the fruit of the flesh. Again, I don't say this because of condemnation. I say it so that we might come to the reality that we need to repent from the fruit of the flesh and begin to bear the fruit of the the Spirit. Again, how will we know? 6 through 8 says this, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life, zoe, right? Preserved, God's quality of life, vitality, strength. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity or an enemy of God. Our carnal flesh, our sinful flesh, is an enemy of Almighty God. You know, really, if we had to break it down, our carnal flesh is an enemy of ourself. Our carnal flesh is what leads us into damnation, into sin, into the wages of sin being death, into sickness, disease, sadness, everything bad that has ever happened and ever will happen is because of sin. Because of our carnal, fleshly desires. What did Eve do? Man, she looked at the fruit. She saw it was good, appealing to the eye, that it was, it was tasty and would make one wise. She allowed her flesh to rise up. And, well, she sinned and caused her husband to sin. And from that day until this, the flesh is ever uh, going to, to, to contradict ourselves and to contradict the Spirit of God. And we, that's why, that's why, that's why we must be bearers of the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, friends, uh, real quick, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to jump all the way down to 11. It says this, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you, uh, or excuse me, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit. Uh, The King James actually says, will quicken your mortal body. That word quicken is the word zupeo, and it is to produce life, to beget a living being, to cause, to live, to make alive, to give life by spiritual power, to arouse and to invigorate, to restore to life, to give increase of life, thus of physical life. My friends, it is the Spirit of God that quickens on the inside of us. It causes us to, to, to come alive on the inside. And we must be being a people. Okay, this is what happens and how it transpires. We receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. At that point, we are saved. Eternity, right? But there, are, there is more than just receiving that salvation. Then we say, Holy Spirit, I desire that you would infill me. Just as you did those disciples all those years ago in the upper room, I desire to begin to walk in the promises of God. I realize that those promises or the fullness of those promises will not be realized, will not be received if I don't receive you. At the point of receiving the Holy Spirit, this makes me and gives me the ability to begin to grow the fruit of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, if I truly am filled with the Holy Spirit, those things will come naturally. And what I have to be on the lookout for is not just bearing that fruit because that comes naturally, everyone and all of them, but now what gifts have I been bestowed with by faith am I willing to step out in so that I might live a fuller life, but not just me, but so that those around me might experience the sozo, the zoe, the sotore, and the dunamis power of all. All of that is contained because it's contained in the Holy Spirit. Thus, we have that treasure in earthen vessels on the inside of us. My friends, we have the explosive power of Almighty God, the glorious power of Almighty God, the saving power of Almighty God on the inside of us. And it's not just for our benefit, though it does benefit us, but it is for the benefit of everybody who is around us. So let us walk in those gifts. Let us bear that fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before you and we desire 
to be fruit bearers, that God, we be receivers of the gifts of the Spirit, that through faith we would walk those things out. We would live it out, live it out, live it out, live it out, oh God. That, Father, we would be a demonstration of your glory to be co-heirs with Christ. Just sila. Stop and think about that for a moment. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Oh, not that we could ever raise to that position in and of ourselves, but the shed blood of Christ has made it possible. And now let us be individuals who walk in those promises. God, that is what we desire, to walk in your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Just lift both hands up where you're at. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause the light of his countenance, his promises, to shine in your life. In Jesus' name, amen.